Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on infrastructure innovations at utility headquarters. So my name is Scott Barry, I'm the director of policy and government affairs for the US Water Alliance, and uh, I have the pleasure to be your moderator today. A um, few housekeeping notes at the start. Uh, all lines are muted, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your window uh, to submit questions to our group, uh, and we'll answer questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, and this webinar is also being recorded, so a link is going to be sent out to uh, all registrants after the webinar and will also be available on our website at uswateralliance.org. Share screen here. So it's great to see so many familiar and new participants with us today. And if this is your first One Water webinar, I want to welcome you. Uh, and if you're new to the Alliance, uh, we're kind of a national uh, membership organization of utilities and businesses and nonprofits dedicated to One Water, which is a, a holistic sort of systems thinking approach uh, to sustainable and equitable water management. And our work educates the nation on the true value of water and the need for investment in its infrastructure. And it accelerates the adoption of One Water management strategies through a program of national dialogues and papers and policy development. Uh, and really celebrates what works through uh, innovation and uh, driving uh, the change in the water sector by highlighting One Water champions. So I'm really excited that we're having this conversation today. I loved getting the chance to, to talk to some of the great innovators uh, that utilities uh, have taken upon themselves uh, to push the envelope of what's possible in our community when it comes to creative things like water reuse, uh, and energy use, and sustainability. And I think these technologies we're going to talk about today not only have a big potential for managing uh, utilities' bottom line, uh, and by extension, the affordability of its services to their customers, uh, but also that really demonstrate the leadership that some utilities are doing uh, to be anchor institutions uh, in their communities uh, by being good stewards of resources. And I'm especially excited that we get to bring you this discussion as part of United for Infrastructure's Week to Champion American Infrastructure. So United for Infrastructure is an organization that convenes American businesses and workers, elected leaders, uh, and, and regular citizens around a single message that let's rebuild together. Uh, the Alliance's Value of Water campaign sits on the steering committee for United for Infrastructure, and we are excited to see all of the events that are going on throughout this week. And so be sure to check out the full calendar online at unitedforinfrastructure.org. And uh, if you're looking for another opportunity to really highlight water infrastructure, its role in people's lives, and how your work impacts it, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk to you all about our National Day of Action uh, called Imagine a Day Without Water. Uh, we hope you join us October 21st for this national education campaign that highlights how, how water is really essential and invaluable and in need of investment. So participation is, is easy and we have a lot of great ideas for you on our website. Uh, and a lot of our folks are getting creative this year in how they're going to talk about their work as on social media or hosting virtual trivia nights or doing video tours and virtual open houses of their facilities. Uh, and distance learning opportunities for schools. There's a ton of ideas out there. So given the state of the world, I think this is a uh, prime opportunity to make the connection between your work in water and the public health uh, that people are thinking about every day now. And it's a great time to pitch articles or op-eds uh, about the need for investment in infrastructure or the need to close a water access gap for those that don't have to imagine a day without water because they live that every day. Um, so check out imaginedaywithoutwater.org for more ideas and info. So getting on with the show, I'm really excited to introduce our three esteemed panelists today. So first, we're going to hear from Brian Good, who's the Chief Administrative Officer for Denver Water. So as Chief Administrative Officer, Brian leads a diverse team of people whose primary focus is to provide excellent internal service to the organization. And his areas of focus include things like safety and security, uh, emergency management, environmental compliance, and sustainability, among several others. So Brian's held several positions at Denver Water over his career, including the Director of Operations and Maintenance, uh, Deputy Manager of Organizational Improvement, and Water Recycling Plant Supervisor. So prior to joining Denver Water, though, Brian managed the source of supply, water treatment, and distribution operations um, for the Champaign, Illinois Division of Illinois American Water Co Corporation. Uh, and next, we're going to hear from Saul Kinter, who's the Program Manager for Business Development and for Energy Initiatives at DC Water. So Saul holds a BSc degree from Princeton University, where his thesis described a new model for distributing water, uh, surface water according to the Texas Water Rights System, uh, and has published or spoken on a wide ranging set of topics, including things like climate variability, uh, ocean atmosphere gas transfer, and the value of water conservation, as well as uh, wastewater thermal energy, which is one of the subjects of his uh, um, uh, conversation today. And at DC Water, he's developed uh, the Bloom Biosolids Marketing Program, uh, and is currently responsible for developing new revenue streams, uh, including things like renewable energy, which is again, one of the things he's gonna talk about today. 
And finally, we're going to hear from Paula Kehoe, who's the Director of Water Resources for the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. So she's responsible for diversifying San Francisco's local water supply portfolio through the implementation of uh, conservation and groundwater, uh, uh, recycled water, on-site water recycling, and other kinds of innovation programs. So lots of great stuff going on. So Paula spearheaded uh, San Francisco's landmark legislation, uh, allowing for the reuse of alternate water sources uh, in buildings. And additionally, Paula is also the chair of the very cool National Blue Ribbon Commission on On-Site non portable Water Systems, which she's also going to be talking a little bit about today. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to toss it over to Brian, who's going to uh, set us up with, and talk to us about what Denver Water is doing. Great. Thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate it, Scott. Just get my screen going. All right. Well, it's an honor to be with you all here today and tell you a little bit about an exciting project that we are wrapping up here at Denver Water almost after almost 10 years of planning and construction. Uh, before I do that, let me begin with a brief introduction about Denver Water. We have a long proud history of service that goes back over a hundred years. Established in 1918, when the people of Denver voted to take over and consolidate several private smaller utilities that were operating here at the time. We now provide water for the city of Denver and about half of the surrounding suburbs, roughly 25% of Colorado's population. In addition to drinking water, we also provide recycled water through a centralized system and have many raw water delivery contracts. On average, we deliver approximately 190 million gallons of water per day. And because we get our water from snowmelt in the Rocky Mountains, we have to go quite a long ways to get it. So we operate across 12 counties with a watershed that covers over 4,000 square miles. Back in 2011, Denver Water began a serious discussion about how to renovate its operations complex. We and our predecessors have been on the site since the 1870s. And up until a few years ago, all of the buildings here, the existing buildings, were in various stages of disrepair. We ultimately decided that this was a chance to model sustainability and pave the way for wise urban water use in Denver, especially in our new administration building, a picture of which you see here and where I'm actually sitting today for the first time in several months. Now, this was a very large construction project that happened in two major phases. It involved five years of construction on a 35 acre site, which needed to main op remain operational the entire time. We demolished 15 buildings, constructed seven new ones, and remodeled two existing structures, including an 1878 pump station that will serve as our conference center. The campus is tied together by a landscaped pedestrian spine that links everything and is part of a wellness loop that circles the facility. From the very beginning, our sustainability goals were aggressive. The new administration building, which has a gross square footage of approximately 186,000 square feet, was designed to be LEED Platinum and Net Zero Energy. And the whole campus includes various elements of one water, as our project team tried to match available water sources with the most appropriate uses on site. We have also incorporated numerous elements of the well building standard even though we are not actually going for certification under that standard. But some of those features include things like treadmills, an on-site fitness center, wellness rooms, healthy food options, enhanced air filtration, and access to views for all employees. Now, in addition to our administration building goal of LEED Platinum, all of the other buildings on site, including operations buildings such as a warehouse, and fleet maintenance facility also had various lead targets. And we're even on track to exceed a few uh, lead targets for remodeled buildings where we were originally shooting for lead certified and now plan to hit lead silver. Rebates from our local energy provider are, are already into six figures for constructing such energy efficient buildings. So for the goal of achieving net zero energy for our administration building, the first step was to design it for minimum energy use. That includes an extremely efficient building envelope with two layers of insulation and triple pane glass throughout. 
There's natural daylighting. This building is 450 feet long, but only 60 feet wide. So light can penetrate all the way to the center of the building. The Southern side of the building has photo cell controlled window blinds, which automatically come down during the day to reduce glare and heat. All of the lighting, both inside and outside the building is LED on campus. We have occupancy and vacancy sensors that control lights and certain plug loads. So for most people, they plug their computer monitors into these, and then if there's nobody on the floor, it shuts those monitors completely off. Hopefully my lights don't go off during the talk, and if so, I'll wave my arms. Um, there's radiant heating and cooling uh, throughout, as well as a central utility plant that I'll talk a little bit more about. This is a photograph of radiant tubes being installed prior to concrete placement, and all but one of the new buildings is both heated and cooled through an in-floor or in some cases an in-ceiling radiant system. Now, those radiant tubes are fed from a four-pipe loop that originates from an on-site central utility plant. So there's a heating water supply and return as well as a chilled water supply and return. Now, this is an incredibly efficient system, which actually uses potable water from a 54 inch water main as a heat sink. So it's very similar to a geothermal well field, but without all the wells. So once we lowered our energy demand as much as possible, we offset the remaining energy load for our administration building with 1.3 megawatts of solar power to achieve net zero energy. Solar panels are located above the third story of our parking garage, shown here, above our visitor's parking lot, and on the roof of our administration building. And you can see the proximity of this site to downtown Denver in this picture. Solar power generation is tracked in 15 minute intervals on a website. And once electric meters have been fully adjusted and calibrated, we will display near real time updates toward our net zero energy goal, so employees and the public can see how we're doing. And all of this work is part of a broader initiative to reach aggressive goals that were established in Denver Water's sustainability guide, which can be found on our website at denverwater.org. This guide outlines specific goals, commitments, and standards for the reduction of energy, carbon, water, and waste as well as objectives for how we manage land and ecosystems. This sustainability guide was first issued in 2017 and it's being updated as we speak. Now, one of the goals in the sustainability guide is to actually achieve net zero energy across all of Denver Water's facilities uh, for at least electric and natural gas for now. And progress is tracked on the chart that you see here. In addition to 1.3 megawatts of solar, Denver Water has 25 and a half megawatts of hydropower capacity at various locations. And our old administration building was incredibly inefficient. And it was our, depending on the month, our second or third largest energy user. So demolishing that building and replacing it with a new net zero energy building has significantly reduced our energy profile. So let's talk a little bit about One Water, a concept that many of you are already familiar with and upon which Paula will expand in just a few moments. For Denver Water's operations complex, the One Water concepts employed include rainwater harvesting, installation of low flow water fixtures, recycling of process water. Uh, for example, we recycle water on a water meter test bench, saves about a million gallons of water a year. Uh, green water infrastructure for stormwater management. Uh, we have an on-site cafeteria, which has uh, been designed for utmost water efficiency, uh, water efficient landscaping and irrigation, and an on-site wastewater treatment and reuse system. The on-site treatment system is designed to treat 7,000 gallons of water per day, and it includes conventional wastewater treatment, followed by three stages of wetlands, filtration, and disinfection with ultraviolet light and hypochlorite. Purified water will be used for toilet flushing in our administration building with any surplus being used on site for irrigation. 
This is a photograph of what the completed wetlands look like inside our main lobby. You can see the wetlands on the lower left and uh, the visitor's parking lot is through the glass in the back with the solar panels above it. Two of the three wetlands are actually located right in the lobby next to the main door and our reception desk. And a third is located just outside uh, of the lobby. And lastly, I'll touch on rainwater harvesting. Starting next irrigation season, rainwater will be collected from the roof of the administration building and from the solar panels located above the parking garage. That's the areas that are shown in light blue on the schematic. And we'll capture that water and collect and store it in the tanks that you see here. And these are obviously now buried. But storage is important for us for flow equalization as rainfall patterns in Denver can be very sporadic. Uh, to say the least, often with long periods of dry weather followed by some uh, short duration heavy rainfall. So we have to store this so we have enough to meet our irrigation needs. Now I should note that none of these one water features was easy or even legal at the time we started this project. And honestly, if someone would have come to us a few years ago wanting to implement a similar project, we probably would have said the same thing, not legal and not possible. But we realize that we have the responsibility to redefine and demonstrate the future of wise urban water use in Denver. And if we're going to do that, we knew we had to get to work and tackle some of these challenges. So for rainwater, we actually had to go to state water court and file a water right where we proposed to replace one for one every gallon of water that we collect off the roof of this building uh, and replace that to the river so that downstream water users remain whole. And there were some challenges to that water rights application. We spent two to three years in water court and finally received approval to do this project last August. For recycled water, we contacted our representatives in the Colorado General Assembly and worked with them to introduce a bill to allow for toilet flushing with recycled water. It was not permitted at the time we started this project. And that bill required state regulators to develop standards and regulations to do so and resulted in Colorado being the first state to adopt the National Blue Ribbon Commission's risk-based log reduction criteria, which you will hear about soon. And we hope that removing these barriers will make it easier and more cost effective for others to implement similar projects in Colorado. And we know that some are already in progress. So where are we today? We moved into our new building last fall and got settled in over the holidays. Obviously we have many fewer, oh, there go the lights. <laughs> Obviously we have many fewer people um, here on site uh, because of COVID uh, than we expected this year. So we are wrapping up our final landscaping at the site and completing all of our necessary lead paperwork. Our energy demand is way down, but our solar production is cranking away. And our on-site non-potable water treatment system is all ready to go, but it has been delayed by COVID because we don't have enough people on site to provide enough inflow so that we can actually commission and run the system. We're also starting to apply these sustainability pro, um, principles to other projects. For example, we're constructing a brand new water treatment plant near Golden, Colorado. It's called our North Water Treatment Plant. And that new plant will go in online in a couple years. And it's not only gonna be net zero energy, but it will be a net energy producer, primarily through hydropower. And another goal in our sustainability guide is commits us to offsetting at least 50% of energy requirements for future projects both new design and major remodels with renewable energy. So there's much more that we can do. We feel like we've come a long ways in the last couple of years, uh, but we have a lot, a long ways to go. If you're interested in additional information, you can visit denverwatertap.org, which contains some stories about our operations complex redevelopment project. With that, I really appreciate your time and attention and I'll turn it over to Saul. Hello, uh, my name is Saul Kinter. I'm the uh, program manager for energy initiatives for DC Water. I wanna thank the US Water Alliance for the opportunity to present today. 
I'm going to be talking about wastewater thermal energy, which is one of the technologies that we installed at our new headquarters building in Washington, D.C., completed in 2018. If we go to the next slide. Could we go to the next slide? Thank you. So uh, DC Water is a water and wastewater utility in Washington, DC. We provide drinking water to the city of Washington and wastewater treatment for both Washington and the surrounding suburbs. At the wastewater treatment plant, we do about 2.2 uh, million people worth of wastewater. DC Water as a whole has about 1,100 employees. Our structure is a little different from many utilities in that we are a governmental authority, but we are independent of the local structure. And that has enabled us to uh, pursue revenue opportunities outside of our standard rate base. That has led to both me having a job as well as our interest in wastewater thermal. Uh, we go to the next slide, which really has one motivation and that is to generate revenue. So our mandated services of water distribution and wastewater treatment have become very expensive, primarily due to um, necessary environmental work. And as a result, we have been looking for anything that we can do to raise money that does not involve further burdening our ratepayer base. Uh, this includes things like uh, licensing our intellectual property, things that we've developed in our laboratory. It includes things like selling our biosolids, and it includes looking for resources that we haven't tapped. My position, in fact, is in our Department of Resource Recovery. So wastewater thermal is a potential resource. Uh, if we go to the next slide. The idea here is that the water in our sewers is a potential source of heating and cooling energy. Uh, we're able to take advantage of the relatively neutral temperatures of wastewater throughout the year to more efficiently heat and cool than we can with either using fossil fuels in a furnace or just electricity in an air conditioner or an electric resistance heater or something like that. Uh, the use of the neutral temperature reservoir increases the efficiency allows for savings in terms of both dollars and energy, and um, enables in DC uh, a particular extra value is the ability to move equipment off the roof. In DC, we have a height restriction on buildings. Uh, the urban legend is that nothing can be taller than the Washington Monument, though actually the, the truth is far more complicated and bureaucratic. Um, but essentially DC is a city without skyscrapers. So we end up having uh, a situation where rooftop space is particularly valuable because the developer, if they want more square footage on a particular lot, cannot actually expand by, uh, by adding more floors. Um, so with the ability to move uh, equipment off the roof, eliminate cooling towers or air handling units, and instead have equipment in the basement that's hooked up to the sewer is uh, a quite a big uh, financial benefit for a developer. We can go to the next slide. I wanna briefly discuss how it works. There's two main technologies. One is to extract the sewage from the sewer, take energy out of it, and then put it back in the sewer. The other is to simply run heat exchange pipes within the walls of the sewer itself. Uh, we only do the first of those two, and we're really only looking at, at the first of those two in Washington. The second is certainly viable, but the hot, it's very, very expensive to dig up sewers just to put in heat exchange pipes. If you're building the sewer anyway, it might be a good idea, uh, we are not building large uh, lengths of sewer pipe in Washington, D.C. right now. Uh, we're spending our capital dollars on other projects. So we are really only looking at uh, situations where we pump sewage out of the sewer. We look at that in more detail on the next slide. So uh, just to make sure everybody understands what we're talking about, it, the, the system is directly analogous to a geothermal system where you exchange your thermal energy with the ground. Here, what we're doing is we're taking sewage out of the sewer main at the... Um, at the left-hand side of this image. Uh, and in this particular appli application, it drops it into a wet well, though that's not always necessary. It's then uh, screened to take out the large debris or, or things that would otherwise interfere with a heat exchanger, uh, pumped out of the wet well, goes through a heat exchanger, and that's the last that the sewage is actually handled. So the, the heat exchanger is closed. There's no direct contact between the sewage and any of the actual clean water. And then conditioned clean water goes into a heat pump and the building farther down the line. Um, the sewage then goes back, uh, picks up the screenings, and goes straight back to the sewer, either colder or hotter, depending. So the end result is that we have warmer sewage in the summer or cooler sewage in the winter, and we've extracted that energy to feed the building. Because we're only moving heat from one place to another, the building warms up by exactly as much as the sewage cools down, uh, we're able to do this very efficiently. And the energy needed to run the pump and the heat pump is quite small compared to the amount that it gets transferred. So we can go to the next slide. 
Uh, so DC Water built a brand new headquarters building. Uh, we finished it in 2018. So it's been operating for a little over two years. It houses our administration and our public functions. So we, we built it in a much more accessible location um, where the public can get to. It's, it's nice and accessible to transit and more downtown than our wastewater treatment plant is. 150,000 square feet houses about 350 or so over 1,100 employees. Very interestingly, it is actually built on top of a pre-existing 1950s sewage pump station. So the building kind of wraps around and over a pre-existing pump station. And that uh, created some opportunities for us. Obviously, we wanted this to be an environmentally oriented building. It's LEED Platinum, uh, has a large number of features, some of which are parallel to the ones that uh, we just heard about in Denver, though I, I don't have time to, to talk about uh, anything other than the wastewater thermal system in detail today. Um, but, but we can go to the next slide. So this is a cutaway of the building, and you can see uh, in, in the pink down at the bottom is the pre-existing sewage pump station, so occupying a big chunk of the first floor and then going down underground. And uh, the white pipe there is actually the outlet pipe. It's the main outlet for the sewage pump station. So all we did to access the sewage was put a bulkhead on a sideline off that pipe and then put a pump next to it. So the sewage just gets pumped straight out of the outlet line when the building has a need for it. It gets lifted up about 20 feet into a utility room where we have a heat exchanger. Uh, that heat exchanger then extracts energy from the sewage and it drops right back down into the outlet line. It's a really simple system. The advantage is that in the winter, the sewage is at about 58 degrees Fahrenheit. So we can extract heat very efficiently. The delta T between 58 and the building's temperature, it may be 72 or 75, is quite small. And the heat pump doesn't have to work very hard. It doesn't have to use a lot of energy to warm the building up. Likewise, in the summer, the sewage is at about 78 Fahrenheit. So um, the net result is that we're able to reduce energy, if we can go to the next slide, by something like 40 to 45% beyond the ASHRAE baseline. And even versus uh, a cooling tower application, we're able to get several percentage points of, uh, of improvement in terms of both the energy consumed and the cost of operation. Um, it's worth mentioning that this building still has a cooling tower. The, uh, the heat exchange unit provides 100% of the capacity so we can run off either the wastewater system or the cooling tower or both. The motivation for the cooling tower, aside from just the resilience benefits of having two systems, was actually to help us reject rainwater. Um, so in DC, uh, we have one of our problems is we have too much rainwater at times, and we need to do a better job of getting rid of it. So by having the cooling tower there that could reject it more quickly, we were able to reduce the size of our storage cistern, uh, which saved us quite a bit of money elsewhere. The net result was a, was a financial boon to the building, as well as helping us achieve uh, lead platinum status. Unfortunately, I don't have any detailed financial numbers, in part because this was a design build project, so we only saw it from a guaranteed maximum price perspective, and in part because uh, we're still actually in the acceptance period for the building, so we don't have any final operational data right now. Um, in, in fact, a small anecdote, uh, the, the sewage system has been down uh, since earlier, about February of this year, uh, because the replacement part is currently stuck in Canada, uh, thanks to coronavirus. So it's, we're lucky for us we had that cooling tower, um, and we're really hoping to get it back up and running soon so we can enjoy the energy savings. But it uh, was not a foreseen uh, benefit, but we were glad that we had both. We can go on to the next slide. So DC Water is thinking beyond this. Uh, we're using headquarters both as uh, to benefit ourselves, but also really as an example. Um, the main value here to DC Water is not heating and cooling our own buildings, of which we don't have, at the end of the day, all that many. The main value to us is in accessing this resource and uh, selling it to others. We sort of think that we're sitting in Titusville, Pennsylvania, and it's 1860. We have a huge energy resource that is untapped beneath our feet, and we want to start taking advantage of it. So we've done a little bit of work here. We can go to the next slide. Uh, we, did a, we did a survey of the temperature in our sewers to get a sense of what energy might be available. This is just an example graph of one of the sewers showing the temperature year, year round. The spikes up and down are rainfall or snow melt events. In the summer, you'll see the temperature spikes and in the winter it drops. Luckily, these are very short duration and don't go too far away. So it really doesn't have much impact on the available energy from the sewer. And you can see that the annual cycle, as I said before, goes from about 78 peak temperature in late summer to about 58 in the winter. That's pretty standard for the mid-Atlantic. Here we are in Washington, DC. Um, honestly, the, the sewage temperatures don't vary that much. Uh, there, is, there is some change by latitude, but it's quite consistent through the year. We can go to the next slide. 
So based on this, looking at about a two degree daily cycle and maybe a 20 degree seasonal cycle, uh, what we found, uh, if you do the calculation, is that for every million gallon per day of flow, you have about a megawatt of available energy, assuming you can put a 10 degree delta T on the sewer, which should be about right. So in Washington, D.C., uh, we have an average flow of about 300 million gallons per day uh, on our wastewater system. And in terms of base flow, you know, dry weather, overnight, you know, counting for some of the daily variation in flow, we can count on about 200 million gallons per day of that as pretty consistent which means we're sitting on 200 megawatts of available thermal energy, which is quite a lot. Um, you know, it's, it's just a, a, a big amount. It's, it's enough to do maybe 100 buildings or more uh, the size of our headquarters. And if we look at the wastewater treatment plant, there's even more available. Um, it's probably maybe another 400 megawatts available at the wastewater plant, though, of course, it's harder to move it from the wastewater plant to uh, any potential customer since it's a bit isolated relative to the rest of the city unlike the sewers, which simply sit under every single street. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, there's, there's really two ways then to take advantage of this. Uh, and this is two examples from Vancouver, which has been one of the leading cities on this front. One is to do a uh, building by building, very similar to our headquarters. Uh, the Gateway Theater is an example of exactly that from Vancouver. It was also built uh, next to a sewage pumping station. And they took advantage. This is just an example picture of the equipment they're using there um, to extract the energy. But we're actually even more excited about the ability to uh, scale this up and build large systems where we're distributing hot and cold water or neutral temperature water and providing the energy to make it at a pump station. The advantage here is that one of the big costs of doing wastewater thermal energy is accessing the sewer. For a headquarters building, it was easy because it was built on top of a pump station. For any other given building, you have to dig down to the sewer and that can be quite expensive. So the uh, potential we see is to build a central system where we have an uh, uh, energy center possibly co-located with a pre-existing sewage pump station. So the sewage access is straightforward and we distribute hot and cold water through pipes to the individual building. Uh, naturally, DC water would be charging a price for this energy, uh, which we would hope to use then to subsidize our water and sewer rates. We can go to the next slide. Uh, Vancouver has actually done this, um, where all the entire area highlighted in yellow is actually heated, heated not cooled because it's Vancouver, uh, but, but it's heated entirely through wastewater thermal uh, as a district energy system, where there is a central facility that heats water and then provides it to all of the buildings there. It's a pretty big system, covers a big chunk of the city, though obviously not downtown. It was a, an area they developed as part of their uh, Winter Olympics in 2010. Uh, the system works well, and it's exactly the sort of thing we're hoping to replicate in D.C. We can go to one more slide. So where we are today, we have a working system at our headquarters. I, actually, it's not working at this particular moment, but it was working perfectly well up until about March of this year. Um, and uh, we have another system uh, at the American Geophysical Union headquarters, which is in the middle of D.C. They tapped into the sewer. You can see the picture uh, on your screen here is actually the sewer that they opened up to tap for that building. Very old sewer dated back to the 1880s. We had a lot of work to do to make sure those bricks weren't going to cave in, but it was worth it. They were able to do it. And now they are the first uh, net zero building um, in Washington. And uh, also, as far as I know, the very first commercial building that is uh, using wastewater thermal for their energy. In that particular instance, they have no backup. The sewer is their only source and uh, they are counting on it to be 100% reliable, which so far uh, it has been. We're looking at district heating and cooling. We have one very good candidate site where we've been in discussions with the local developer. Uh, they're gonna build about 2 million square feet of new mixed use buildings. And we're very excited that, that we're, we're going to be able to supply them with heating and cooling in that location. We also have a number of other buildings. We've been reaching out to the local developer community, reaching out to the local uh, HVAC engineers to make sure that they're aware that uh, A, this technology is out there and it works, and B, that DC Water is very interested in uh, saying yes to a project like this. We've heard one of the main uh, concerns from engineers and developers is that, you know, even if they were interested, they might come to the utility and say, you know, we want to do this and just hear, you know, oh, there's no way we can't risk our sewers. We can't, you know, the permitting and legal, this is really, it's all very difficult. We want to make sure that they know that DC Water is uh, really open for business on this subject and that we have uh, done some demonstration work already and we have cleared away as many of the barriers as we possibly can. Obviously, we're still going to review designs and make sure that, that they're being going to be built properly, but, um, but generally that, that we will say yes to any reasonable project uh, that is looking to do this sort of thing. So uh, that's where we are uh, in DC. Uh, we're excited about the potential to lower the city's carbon footprint, uh, more excited about the potential to help us uh, reduce our water rates. Um, but it is the sort of thing that we were, we were really proud to be able to pilot in our new headquarters building. 
So uh, that's the end of my, uh, my piece of this webinar, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Paula Kehoe from San Francisco. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Al. Um, fantastic project and work. It's very exciting. Um, I'm Paula Kehoe from the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And advance to the next slide, please. Uh, just a quick background. Uh, the San Francisco PUC, we provide three utility services, water, power, and wastewater. Next. Uh, we've been delivering high quality, uh, reliable drinking water for over 100 years. However, as we all face um, many challenges in terms of water supply reliability into the future, um, from droughts, potential earthquakes, we have aging infrastructure, San Francisco is rapidly growing, uh, we have stormwater management, management issues, and we also have uh, the potential to release more water in uh, our streams and rivers. Next. So um, the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, and in particular, our general manager, Harlan Kelly, really asked us to formalize um, a one water approach, um, really about uh, taking an integrated approach uh, in terms of planning as well as implementation um, among all of our three enterprises and three utility services. Um, and really moving away from this concept about water in and water out, this linear approach to a one water, more circular economy, more uh, an integrated approach. Next. And um, our local water program in San Francisco really is a, a great reflection and example of one water. Um, we have a number of different programs. We have a conservation program. Um, we have our current residential per capita is 41 gallons per person per day in San Francisco. It's half the statewide average. We have a groundwater po program. We've recently started pumping groundwater from San Francisco and blending that with our surface water supplies to serve our customers. We also have a recycled water program where we're producing uh, non-potable water, uh, recycled water to serve our golf courses. Um, but we're also studying purified water, the opportunity to produce uh, water uh, as a source for drinking. And uh, the areas that I'm gonna really focus on today are really our on-site water reuse program as well as our innovations program. Next, please. Um, and just to clarify and, and just provide context on terms of on-site water recycling and water reuse, what we're talking about is actually capturing uh, various types of water sources, alternate water sources, such as rainwater, stormwater, gray water, uh, foundation drainage or black water, and capturing that on site, either in a building um, or in a neighborhood, um, and reusing that water for non-potable applications. Um, the San Francisco PUC really recognized um, that we have an opportunity that, that we're missing, um, and this opportunity is to capture this water on site and reuse it. Next, please. So when it came to building our new headquarters, um, and we moved into our headquarters here, shown on the, on the left in, in 2012, we decided that we really um, need to practice what we preach. If we think that this is a great opportunity, hey, we should try it in our own building. And so it is a LEED Platinum. We have a whole host of uh, features uh, similar to what uh, Brian just uh, explained in terms of his building. Um, but I'm just gonna focus on the, on the on-site water recycling component. Uh, we have installed an engineered um, uh, wetland treatment system, again, similar to Brian's um, uh, system in his building. Uh, the system captures all of our wastewater or black water that we produce in the building. It runs through the wetland treatment system. Uh, we then disinfect that water uh, with UV and chlorine and that water goes back to flush our toilets and our urinals in the building. And so we've been able to save um, uh, over 50% of our indoor potable water demands as a result of this system. And so we were very excited about, about this effort at the utility and again, excited to be able to, to have it in our headquarters as a demonstration, but we really wanted to move beyond that. And um, moving beyond that, next please, really meant that we needed to establish a program um, that has the necessary oversight and management to allow other buildings in San Francisco to collect and treat alternate water sources for non-potable applications. Um, recognizing at this time, back in, in 2012, there, are, there weren't any uh, state programs or any federal programs in terms of oversight and management or, or water quality standards. So we, we realized and we recognized that, again, if we really want to see this uh, scale up in San Francisco beyond just our headquarters, we needed to have our own 
uh, program in place. And so what we did in, in 2012 was we established an ordinance, a local city ordinance that really just codifies and identifies the different roles and responsibilities from four city agencies, our, uh, the PUC, our local department of public health, our local building department, as well as our local public works uh, department. We each play a different role and responsibility, but it's really, again, uh, an integrated approach on the city level in terms of water management. Next, please. And, and this program really has evolved over time. Uh, we moved, again, the ordinance went into play in 2012 uh, for just a single building. Again, uh, the model that we have in our own headquarters. But in 2013, we went ahead and amended that ordinance to allow what we call district scale systems. So for example, one building could collect and treat uh, water on site, but then share it with, with the surrounding buildings. Uh, we moved towards a district scale um, ordinance and uh, allowing that application because of it's more cost effective uh, to have systems, uh, oh, a district scale system um, and sharing that water in buildings. And in 2015, um, California was in a, the height of its drought and it became a mandatory requirement for all new development in San Francisco over 250,000 square feet um, to install their own on-site water treatment system in the building uh, to capture water for their own toilet flushing um, needs as well as their irrigation needs. And in 2019, we moved beyond um, just a building scale. We've moved into looking at larger commercial water users and, and we focused first on breweries um, and we've established our own uh, program. Again, there aren't any state standards or programs um, to allow breweries to capture their own process water on site, uh, reuse that water uh, uh, within the facility as well as a source water for beer. Next, please. I'm just going to show a few examples of some buildings very quickly. Um, so uh, here's a, a large residential uh, 550 unit building, uh, residential building in San Francisco that's installing a, re a gray water treatment system for toilet flushing and irrigation. Uh, they estimate that they'll save about 13% potable water offset. Um, we, we also uh, have had some delays uh, due to COVID. So this, this building is, is currently uh, delayed in terms of its commissioning, but hopefully soon. Next, I just wanna provide an example of a district scale system. This is actually a large new redevelopment project in San Francisco, it's 11 parcels. Uh, they opted to move beyond the ordinance and collect their black water. Uh, and treat, uh, treat it to meet its toilet flushing and irrigation demands. And they'll, they expect that they'll have over 50% potable offset uh, in terms of their overall water demand. And they've taken a unique approach here, uh, actually establishing a nonprofit utility to operate and manage the district system on the behalf of, of the developer. Next. Um, and my third uh, example um, is just to show uh, foundation drainage, which is basically nuisance groundwater. Uh, one of our largest industrial customers is an is a energy provider underground steam loop. Uh, we work with them very closely to actually use the foundation drainage, treat it, um, and put it into the steam, underground steam loop. And they've been able to save uh, more than 30% of their potable water. Uh, it's been a very exciting partnership, um, taking again a, a water resource that was just sent to the sewer system and actually use it uh, within the industrial application. Next, please. Um, and and we've, we've also um, been working and thinking about other innovations in San Francisco. And I'm just gonna touch on a couple of them very quickly. Uh, one is atmospheric water generation technologies. Uh, basically, this is a picture on the top left of a solar panel at the Denver Botanical Garden. Uh, we are working on installing them at our local gardens in San Francisco, our San Francisco Botanical Garden, as well as another community garden to capture, um, to produce uh, water from, from a solar panel. Also uh, to engage the community about the role of water and to produce water for, for irrigation, as well as testing that water for drinking water purposes. Um, as I mentioned, we've moved into the brewery process, water reuse, it's an exciting application uh, and certainly uh, possibilities, great possibilities to use that water for uh, source water. Uh, wastewater heat recovery through our, our grant program, we uh, provided funds to, for these uh, treatment systems in, in multifamily buildings that capture gray water or rainwater to install wastewater heat recovery system that Saul just did a fantastic job explaining. Um, so that you teed that up very nicely for me, thank you. Um, and then also finally, just to touch on that purified water pilot, as I mentioned in our own building, we treat the water uh, 
to, to flush the toilets. However, we added additional treatment technologies to see could we produce water quality that's comparable to drinking water in our own building. And so it was a great success and we did indeed do that. Um, and um, so it's exciting to see the opportunities and, and to contemplate the possibility of producing uh, drinking water on a building scale. Next, please. Um, but we've also been working very hard uh, across the country and, and with uh, partners, again, uh, throughout the United States and North America to really create a consistent national approach. Um, and why we want to do that is that, for example, what's happening in Colorado or New York or Texas is uh, we all have different approaches to on-site water recycling and these decentralized water treatment systems. There's different regulatory standards and, and different approaches. And I think that we've all recognized if we want to see these kinds of systems scale up and more cost-effective systems, we really need consistent approaches uh, throughout the U.S. Next, please. And so in 2016, uh, we had the pleasure of partnering with the U.S. Water Alliance to establish the National Blue Ribbon Commission for on-site non-potable water systems. It was a very important effort and just a very exciting time and continues to be an exciting time um, where we've worked with uh, public health regulators, water utilities, and wastewater utilities from across the United States. Um, and the purpose of our gathering uh, really is to focus on um, some of our key issues. Next, please. Um, and it's really, again, as I mentioned, uh, creating consistency, but creating consistent water quality standards from state to state uh, to promote risk-based water quality standards that are protective of public health. We wanna ensure that these treatment systems are protective of public health when they're on a decentralized scale or, or not handled by or managed by the, the public utility. Uh, we wanna encourage local oversight and management programs, and of course, establish a very key forum for peer-to-peer -peer learning. As we know, uh, the best learning is peer-to-peer -peer from practitioners um, to share lessons learned. Um, so next few slides, I'm just gonna show you some of the materials that we've developed. They're all available publicly. And the whole purpose, again, of the work that we do is to share this information uh, for, for, for all to, to learn from. And so the next, uh, yes, thank you. The most, one of our most important documents was established in the water quality standards. It's a, basically a log reduction target approach. Uh, again, it's about uh, protecting public health from key pathogens, again, um, when these treatment systems are installed, installed for toilet flushing and irrigation, other non-potable end uses. Next, please. And so with that work, then we were able to develop model regulations, uh, in, again, to ensure consistency across the US. Um, and we, this guidebook that we developed included regulations as well as uh, local oversight and management. Um, San Francisco has adopted this. You heard from Brian earlier, Colorado was the first state to amend Regulation 84. We're very excited and we're very proud of all the leadership um, from Brian and his colleagues in Colorado. Um, California uh, passed legislation SB 966 and Hawaii a legislation H HB 444 um, to establish uh, water quality standards that are all based on this framework that, that we established from the National Blue Ribbon Commission. Again, creating consistency. Uh, Minnesota and Washington, D.C. Um, have uh, incorporated um, our approach, our water quality approach, uh, within their guidelines from stormwater management. Uh, Washington State and Oregon State have had leg proposed legislation, again, to create the same kind of framework. And Austin, Texas, and Alaska are also very interested in pursuing this, uh, again, the, these consistent water quality standards. Next, please. Um, we haven't forgotten about the potential uh, concerns or considerations from utilities. As we know, uh, this is a whole sort of transformation in terms of, of uh, not the utility providing some of these services. So again, uh, partnering uh, with the U.S. Water Alliance, we were able to develop uh, a, a guidebook um, looking at um, some of the utility case studies and examples about um, how communities throughout the U.S., um, managed uh, on-site water treatment systems and some of the benefits, um, which included stretching our drinking water supplies. Some communities obviously can see benefits from stormwater management. Um, even some communities saw deferred capital investment in larger centralized infrastructure and also the opportunity for a potential lower energy footprint. Next, please. 
And um, which I think is also really exciting is um, we're also starting to see utilities incorporating the role of on-site water treatment systems in their water management portfolios. So this is not necessarily just something like a, a, a building wanting to have a green building or a lead platinum building. This is also about the utilities themselves recognizing uh, the value that these on-site water treatment systems can play in their portfolios. Um, San Francisco, I've already talked about. Denver um, obviously has their black water treatment system and, and Brian and again, his colleagues have been doing a lot of work throughout Colorado. Uh, this is the city of St. Paul. Austin Water has a water forward plan that includes 10 million gallons a day from decentralized water treatment systems alone by 2040. Uh, Santa Monica, Vancouver, New York City, Anaheim, and Portland. Again, all of these cities have recognized uh, that the value of these uh, on-site water treatment systems can provide in their, in their own water management portfolios. Next, please. Um, and I just wanna touch on our uh, one of our most recent uh, guidance manuals, it's really to get into a greater detail uh, about designing these systems, operating these systems, again, addi additional information for regulators, program administrators, and systems owners. All of these materials are available. And my last slide, um, I just want to mention the work that we're working on right now within the National Blue Ribbon Commission. Next, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, is we're working on an operator certi certification program for on-site decentralized water treatment systems. Again, this, this gap in, uh, we don't have it, we have, we have a wastewater operator, uh, certificate programs or water, but we don't have anything for decentralized water treatment system. And so this is a partnership uh, that we've established with Water Environment Federation. It's really to develop a basis, uh, again, about how these systems incorporate both water and wastewater treatment technologies. Uh, the plan is to develop a, an exam and recommendations, uh, as well as a, a study reference guide for um, exam takers. And so my last slide just provides uh, the links to all of our materials, and I hope that you have an opportunity to look at them. I just want to also comment that the Blue Ribbon Commission is, is open to all public agencies. If you're a, a public health regulator, state, local, federal, uh, or water or wastewater utility, uh, please join us. Um, you can contact me. You also have their information about the Blue Ribbon Commission. And finally, I also want to mention our other partners, uh, with the Blue Ribbon Commission, also our Water Research Foundation, as well as the Water Reuse Association, in addition to the US Water Alliance. So I wanna thank you for uh, the time and thank you for the opportunity to participate today. Great, thanks so much, Paula and Brian and Saul for uh, all of the great information that you just came in. Uh, and we've got a couple of questions kind of in the queue. Uh, but I wanted to start off with a quick reminder that uh, the recording is going to be available. We've got a couple of questions about this recording is going to be available afterwards. It'll be emailed to folks and will uh, be available on the uswateralliance.org website under past events. Uh, and if you're still looking to submit a uh, question and answer, you can do it right here on the Q&A button directly beneath us. Um, uh, first, I want to kind of get a, a question tossed to um, all of the, the, the panelists here. Um, I, I, how do you build support for some of these new technologies from uh, places like your utility board or council? Because some of these things are kind of pushing the, ed the edge or like in, in Brian's case and Paul's cases, they, there weren't really even active laws that allowed you to do these kinds of things. So how did you build that sort of support internally? You want to go, Paula, or do you want me to go? Well, Paula's the, uh, the actual queen of doing this. She's been able to to build consensus and get different organizations on board in San Francisco and across the country too. Um, you know, I think for us, uh, it's helpful to have a board that wants to do this, that that understands uh, that water, um, for, at least for us in Colorado, water is limited. You know, we're in a high plains desert here. On average, Denver gets 16 to 17 inches of precipitation a year, and that includes snow uh, in Denver. So. Um, recognizing that all options have to be on the table, that we need to be able to, yes, use our traditional uh, potable water supplies that come from the snow melt, but also need to be exploring these different options. You know, we've got a centralized reuse system here that's been operating since 2004. Um, we've got raw water deliveries that we use, but it's really trying to make sure that we're kind of staying ahead of what is likely to be long-term shortage issue um, and so our board has just been very proactive about doing that. Um, and then, and frankly, the other, even our state regulators have also been terrific about recognizing 
yeah, water is in short supply here. Let's figure out a way to make this happen. Uh, instead of putting up barriers, they've been terrific partners. So we've been very fortunate here. Yeah, and I'll just add, I think I think the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, both the employees as well as our leadership have recognized that we, we always need to be more innovative. We need to not abandon our, our business, our centralized infrastructure, but what can we do to adapt to that? We need to transform ourselves um, so we can be prepared for the future. Um, we also have a community that really is engaged in water and is engaged in, in transformation as well. When we developed our program, uh, we also had building owners coming to us saying, hey, I wanna treat my gray water. I wanna treat my rainwater on site, but I need help from you all. And at the beginning in 2010, we'd go to meetings and there'd be 50 city um, people there and that just didn't work. So we knew that we needed, we wanted to do it from a utility perspective, but we also wanted to be a good partner with the community. Um, and in order to do that, our job is really to help streamline uh, permitting and regulations to make everyone's job easier. Um, so I would say that, that I'm thankful that I work for a utility uh, that is interested in providing reliable water, that we have a community that's interested, as well as our policymakers that are all willing to do something different and take a risk because innovation and transformation does involve risk. And, um, and it's just been a, a great opportunity to be able to participate in all of that. And of course, all the national work is based on science, uh, which is so important to ensure that we are protecting public health. In my case, the story is a little bit different. We have um, a uh, you know a directive from the top to seek out uh, potential sources of revenue. So the question is really more, you know, how realistic are is this to be able to turn into a real program? What are the potential returns? And um, you know how how long will it take? So we put together a business case, um, you know, determine if if it's going to be potentially a viable program. And if we make a good case, we usually get the green light to pursue it. That doesn't mean it always works, but uh, you know we we generally have a lot of support for this kind of thing from the top because the need is so obvious for for this kind of uh, additional revenue. Great, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And um, Paula mentioned uh, working you know with a great group of employees, and that kind of got me wondering like you are moving in some cases like I think Brian mentioned you know moving from a fairly old system or building into a fairly new system or building. Uh, and what kind of education approach did it take with uh, regular employees or with uh, just the you know the folks that are occupying the building? I guess kind of in you know, a pre-COVID world uh, to get used to these new systems, new ways of doing things. You know, you know, lights that kind of turn off uh, or, or toilets that may flush a little different way. Like, how, how did that work? I know for us there was a a lot of uh, nervous anticipation about what was going to happen when we moved in and. Um, it's been kind of funny. There are folks that love the shades that come down and uh, keep some of the glare out during the day. There are other people that want them open so that they can see the views. Um, there are some folks that get frustrated when the, the lights turn off um, and others realize that that's just a way that we're, that we're working. Um, the biggest question is probably going to come up when we actually do start our on-site um, non-potable water system, which I'm sure Paula can talk about more. And frankly, we're learning from her too about how to message the safety of that. Uh, we've got a ton of signs that are already up in the in the restrooms and other places to explaining how the system works and what you should uh, do and not do there. Um, but it's the biggest thing that we did for change management was involve people during construction. So we gave tours every week uh, of the building. We did videos during construction to show people the progress. We put out a ton of information explaining the different sustainability features, not just what they are, but why we're doing it and why it's important, not only to um, our building and to Colorado, but for our ratepayers as well. I'll just add a little bit onto that. I, I think, you know, when we moved into our new headquarters, um, you know, we had um, our, our old buildings, we had the big cubes with the big gray walls, you know, which is sort of your own fortress, which is is nice, right? Um, and we moved into a building with, with it was all open floor and lots of light and lots of glass. And so that the, the transition, um, I think for anybody, I think we recognize change is hard, right? It takes time. 
to adjust. And, and so um, that was a big deal, but now everyone loves it. Um, um, but also I, I think, you know, in terms of the, in particular on the, on, on the onsite non-potable water treatment system, the living machine was one, just to acknowledge we're not drinking this water. Um, and so, you know, and the value of, of, of why we're doing it. Uh, again, we have a whole, a number of other sustainability features as well. Uh, low flow fixtures and energy, et cetera. So we, we combined all of that together. I, I think the, the bigger um, challenge was when we did the pilot um, where we were, we were producing drinking water um, from our wastewater. We certainly needed to do extra outreach and education that we, again, were not drinking this water. Uh, we did tastings uh, for those that wanted to do that. And, and again, uh, we had a public, you know, uh, meetings or in terms of the entire building can come learn and, and, and learn more about these efforts. Um, but I just think in general change is hard. And I think that uh, we all know when we go into it that uh, we have to spend a little extra time on explaining why we're, why we're changing and, and the benefits and also to listen to people um, in case they have concerns and, and try to address those as best we can. Yeah, the the wastewater system is really invisible to the employees. Um, I mean, we do we do get complaints about areas that are too hot or cold, but that has relatively little to do with the actual uh, wastewater system, which is the power plant, and much more to do with the uh, the air handling and and how the ductwork is set up and being uh, controlled and louvered. Um, I can echo Brian's comment though. Uh, well, we have some toilets that are uh, rainwater harvested rainwater flushed. And um, unfortunately, the color of the water when they first started to use them was uh, exactly the right shade of yellow, I think is the best way to put it. And uh, so people were quite squeamish about that. And it, it required a lot of quick signage to go in place explaining that uh, this wasn't a toilet that had, say, not been flushed. It was just, uh, you know, water coming out off the roof and, and out of the parking lot. So, um, you know, making sure that everybody got the message and, and people adapted to it very quickly, I think. But making sure that everybody got the message was uh, was very important. Yeah, and I, I definitely hear that, that public outreach and education. And I, I wish I had more time to get uh, deeper into that. But uh, it looks like we're running out of time. So I want to just leave everyone with one last kind of question about, like, if there were utilities that wanted to implement some of the changes and ideas that you all have in your systems, what is one piece of advice you would give to them? Uh, it's it, there. It's going to be harder than you think. Um, it's a lot easier now, thanks to some of the work, like on the the water treatment systems that Paul and the National Blue Ribbon Commission have done. But you're still going to run into unforeseen challenges. Whether that's like for us, some of the challenges were when inspectors came out from the city of Denver. They had never seen anything like this before, and they shut our job down because they're like, "Wait a minute, what is this dual plumb system and a treatment? And we don't understand it." Um, and so there's all sorts of things like that that you won't understand. So just build a little extra time in, I think, um, to to do some of those collaboration and outreach and expect that you're going to have a few hurdles like that. Yeah, and I would just echo some, I mean, what Brian said. I think, I think um, again, change is, is inherent, uh, is sometimes challenging. Um, but doing business as usual is challenging. That's not going to help us into the future. We all know that we need to adapt and transform. And so um, we, we just recognize that it's challenging and all of our work is challenging. I, I, I think that every day our, our work of delivering high quality drinking water and wastewater and power is challenging in its own and it's on its own without any kind of new innovative technology or different type of treatment technology. So that's challenging. And then this is equally challenging, um, but it's worth it because we all need to, we need to adapt and, and change um, our business practices um, for the future uncertainties that we're all facing. Um, and so a little patience goes a long way and listening goes a tremendous way. Yeah, in, in our case, um, you know, it, it's been a big shift in mindset where we were used to, uh, you know, selling, so to speak, a product that everybody had to buy every day. Um, and, and that meant that we were not very good salespeople. Um, now that we're looking to, you know, provide something on a sort of a market basis, we really had to adopt a sales mentality. And uh, I think the biggest single thing we had to learn with that was to be able to repeat yourself over and over and over again and make sure that that message is just being reiterated um, to as many different people or the same people as many times over again as possible. Great advice. Thanks all three of you. Um, and I just want to thank everyone out there for uh, 
taking the time to take a few extra minutes to watch the end of this webinar with us. And I want to thank uh, Paula, Brian, and Saul one more time for their awesome contributions to this conversation. And uh, we'll see everybody next month for our, uh, our new uh, three-part series on uh, implementing One Water through engineering, planning, and financing. So look for more information on that uh, coming soon uh, from U.S. Water Alliance. So thanks, everyone, and uh, take care. Thank you.